Is that the one that I want? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> oh, did that inspire any reasonable questions from reasonable people in the crowd? Or from those of you at home who are obviously logged in and Skyping or something like that, who, whoever's on the other end of that and... No? Never mind, you're mute. Anyone? Good. I have a reasonable. I have a question. You yes, Andy. <laughs> so your imagery with with the penguins, I, it makes me wonder. Do you yourself have a spirit animal? <laughs> Funny you should ask that, Andy. <laughs> Funny indeed. I do have a spirit animal. <laughs> Can you elaborate? What is your spirit animal? Oh, I just thought you wanted to know if I had one. <clears throat> and I do. Um, well, but yes. Well, that's enough to win me the bet, but I'd like to bring back more information. Sure. Um, my spirit animal is Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> shocking. How is that shocking? If you had the choice of a spirit animal, would you not pick Ben Franklin? My God, he discovered electricity. Without that, we wouldn't have computers and I couldn't write this crap. Stuff. This great, great stuff that you can buy at Amazon.com. Or... They can't buy it right here. This is why I'm in front of the camera and you're just a stupid minion. <clears throat> that was my lawyer. Yes, sir! Oh, way back... Oh, now I can see back there. Yes? Is Benjamin Franklin with you right now? <laughs> Excuse me, would someone roll his int again? <laughs> because um, in case you did go through public school, Benjamin Franklin died a long, long time ago. Like somewhere around 1940, okay? Okay, so I guess the bad I'm going to ask you what 2 plus 2 is then. Sorry, what? What 2 plus 2 is? Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Chapter 15 in the McSterling scenes Wolfstronaut. <laughs> the wolf in space clothing. Commander Decker took the last vial from the Porter Lab easy tray and flipped the top open. With a pair of space tweezers in the other hand, he took a tiny sample of gray moon mass and carefully lowered it into the vial. He smiled smugly to himself at the gall that Krakovich had in claiming his work was the purview of eggheads and big brain boys mm -hmm. and was therefore above his abilities. It was no more difficult than pulling a negative 5G inverted scissors at Mach 2 while evading an enemy surface-to-air missile. <laughs> Simple as cake, he said out loud, to no one in particular. Wait, he suddenly thought. Was the expression simple as cake or simple as pie? No matter, he liked cake better anyway. When the lunar pebble contacted the chemicals in the vial, a frantic bubbling reaction churned within as the chemicals dissolved the sample and formed a brilliant turquoise solution. Decker flipped the cap shut with his thumb and replaced the vial in the easy tray, alongside the other four color-coded samples. He then replaced the space tweezers in their tool slot and snapped the easy tray shut. At that moment, the light from the earth rise swept across the crater in which Decker had set up the lab, casting its bright glow across the basin. The difference in brilliance before and after Earthrise caused Decker to blink momentarily as his eyes adjusted to the increased glare. The auto-polarizing helmet visor of his spacesuit kicked in after a second to cut the glare and allow his vision to sharpen. As his eyes adapted, he took in the stark, barren view of the ashen rock and then tapped his wrist to activate the suit-to-suit -suit communicator. There had been no contact with the others since Decker had come over the third ridge line and into the crater. The orbital vehicle had most likely been out of range at the moment, 
so no communications relay and therefore no contact was expected, but Decker decided to try anyway. Sample team, this is Decker. I have completed the tests before Earthrise. I am preparing to pack out the portal lab and will return shortly. Decker out. Only a low hum followed by static met his ear, indicating to Decker that his message had not been received. Regardless, he was going to do this by the book, even if that book was the one he had written for himself. He took a seat at the porter chair and packed the easy tray into the portal lab case. A surprising tap on his right shoulder startled him and he nearly jumped. He took a deep breath to calm himself as he realized that Krakovich and the rest of the team must have decided to pull a surprise inspection on him to make sure he didn't mess things up. It was unbelievable to him that, with the possible exception of Miss Softwhistle, that they had yet to realize that Commander Steve Decker was not someone who messed things up. Okay, Professor, Decker spoke over his shoulder. In case you didn't get the memo, I... Decker paused as the hand that tapped him on the shoulder drifted past him, revealing itself to be a severed arm still in the spacesuit, but floating freely, its hand still gripping a tether line that trailed behind it. But the size of, by the size of the arm, it had to belong to Corporal Bucky Evans. Decker gasped leaping to his feet, grabbed the tether and turned around swiftly, his heart pounding, stomach nodding. Grasping the other end of the tether, approximately 20 feet away from him, stood a gigantic, hairy being draped in the remains of a shredded spacesuit. The boots and gloves of the suit were missing, clearly having been stretched apart by the massive clawed hands and canine-like feet. The suit's helmet was still in place, the polarizing visor mirroring the bright light and obscuring the face of what appeared to be a monstrous wolf man. Decker's communicator switched off, filling his ears with heavy panting. Switched on, filling his ears with heavy panting. My God, he thought, how could such a creature survive in the harsh lunar conditions without the benefit of a spacesuit? His head filled with rage as he thought about the young Corporal Evans, who at the tender age of 21 would never live to see the return trip home. Anger melded with his fear of the massive creature before him, forming a ball of determination within his very soul. Whatever this thing was before him, however it could exist, it would pay for what it had done to Bucky. The fact that a mythical creature could exist at all, let alone on the moon, was irrelevant. Steve Decker would not tolerate severed arms or death of friends, whatever the cause. Roaring his traditional battle cry, Ah! Used primarily during operations with the opposite sex and crippling, gripping his small pickaxe in his right hand. He pushed off the surface and lunged towards the wolfman, using the lightness of the lunar gravity to speed towards it. The creature did the same and they headed towards a violent mid-air collision. As they came into contact, Decker spun around, twisting to the right of the creature, and with a mighty flex of his pancreas, drove the pickaxe through the creature's helmet, shattering the visor and connecting with the canine snout of the beast. The helmet spun wildly into space. <laughs> These are long sentences. The helmet spun wildly into space, revealing the dog-like, slobbering face of the wolfman. With a snarl, it managed to snag him as he flew past, spinning him around and sending the two of them spiraling back toward the portal lab. Its clawed hand locked on Decker's right wrist, squeezing so hard that the axe fell from his nerveless fingers. Decker could only watch in horror as the tool floated away. Decker struggled against the thing's mighty grasp as it growled and drooled and reached back to splay Decker's spacesuit asunder. As he floated over the edge of the lab, Decker frantically reached to the ground and grabbed the porta chair with his free hand. He desperately swung it around, parrying the creature's blow away. Bringing the chair down into the beast's head, he forced it to free his grip on him. The momentum from smiting the creature on the muzzle brought Decker in contact with the ground. He tucked his shoulder and rolled towards the porta table. The wolfman collided into the lunar surface not 15 feet away and quickly scrambled to his fur-covered feet. In only an instant, it lunged forward again. Decker worked in pure adrenaline and bile now and reacted without thinking. He pushed himself directly away from the creature and as he passed the collapsible portafile cabinet, he reached out, managing to fling the file drawer open between him and the lunging lycanthrope. 
<laughs> the beast smashed muzzle first into the porta steel drawer, sending the file cabinet twisting and spewing in its many dozens of folders of untold scientific experiments and data across the Lotus Gate. <laughs> He grabbed the porta beaker off the porta table and flung the large vial of yellow green liquid at the stunned creature. It crashed into the eyes of the beast, causing it to howl in pain, but the monstrous creature refused to yield and indeed pressed forward. As Decker again felt his feet regain the dusty ground, he grabbed the adjustable high power porta lamp clipped directly to the side of the porta table, whipped himself around, and crushed the sturdy lamp into the furry back of the bloodied beast's head. The wolfman let out a whimper and floated away. It regained its footing and sensing that it had met his match in Decker, scampered off out of the crater. A terrible howl echoed through the, loader val through the lunar valley. Howl echoed through the lunar valley. <laughs> Decker took a breath. He looked at the severed arm of Corporal Evans, now floating freely across the crater, the loose tether slowly dragging behind. Revenge for Bucky would have to wait for another day. In the meantime, Decker would have to regain communication with the lunar module orbiting above and hopefully track down the others to discover just what on the moon could possibly fight toe to toe with him. Decker's eyes fell to the clenched hand. In fighting the wolfman, he had managed to grab a piece of the spacesuit loosely covering the creature. It was the name tag. It read, Krakovich. <laughs> Thank you. So, we have a question from an online viewer. Uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> we have viewers online. Really? Excellent. Will any of the McSterling scenes be optioned for feature films? Well, the McSterling scenes, no, because they are part of other books. However, those books, some of which have already been optioned into movies on the SYFY channel, and uh, others are in pre-production, such as Fairy Hunter 880BD, starring the lovely Jen Page. And uh, I am in negotiations for Elevator, the Clock of Time, and The Crack of Uncertainty. <laughs> also, sci-fi passed on Sky Shark, but I am thinking about possibly self-producing that. And the last Elven, sorry, <clears throat> I don't even know the titles of my own books. The last great Elven dance-off has been optioned by Fox to become a reality show. <laughs> I hope that answers your question because you type in the thing and Andy will tell me what you say back. Thank you very much for your question. Much appreciated. Anyone here with a non-math question? <laughs> if you were limited to one metaphor for the rest of your life, what metaphor would it be? <laughs> Dictionary.com <laughs> Metaphor uh, That's not the simile thing, right? It's like that. <laughs> Yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> no. <clears throat> Gonna leave it on that one. Like Sterling Thong 20, Andy 1. Yeah, that's actually, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's probably copyright, so you really probably shouldn't reveal that anymore. That's why you always bring your lawyers to readings. <laughs> uh, oh. This is one I have not read in a long time. And if you would all indulge me, I would love to read uh, from Dwarves Book the First, Where the Sun Shines Not, The Shaft. <laughs> 